What's up, player? Yo. How you doing, man? We out here. Tight, tight. Another day, another episode of the Music Business Podcast. You know what it is. You know the vibes. Today, we have a special guest, Boss Van Leeuwen. Boss is the CEO and founder of Chill Hop Music. If you haven't heard of Chill Hop directly, I'm sure you've listened to some of their playlists on YouTube. They have a lot, a lot of great playlists. They have the low, the the the, the famous lo-fi playlist you guys have heard. I'm sure they were on Chill Hop Music, but not not just that. But he's grown this empire into a, a record label where he actually provides record label services for artists around the world, and they're based in Rotterdam, Amsterdam. Yeah, I think they're getting millions of listens per month uh, across all the different artists that then kind of like signed records on the record label. I think it incredible story, just how he's been able to go from really just kind of building up this YouTube following organically to building a 25 person record label that that it's kind of at the front of its class when it comes to what it looks like to be a modern record label that really has kind of digital distribution baked straight into its DNA. Right. Uh, I think, a lot of what he's done when it, and he also has just, just this artist first empathy, I think that is lives its way into the deal structure with his artists, how he goes about trying to really create a sense of care and connection with the artists. Uh, I think it's a, yes, it might be a smaller, more like boutique record label, but he's really become like a pioneer of enabling the sound and enabling artists to make a, a living off of this sound and, Really exciting to to dive into this episode. I think his insights when it comes to building community, nurturing connection with fans, and not necessarily always defaulting to try and build the biggest fan base, but to also focus a lot and almost more so prioritize building a deeper connection with your current fans, I think was a really interesting insight and in how he's been able to kind of do that at scale to me was really exciting. Absolutely. He's also, you know, run a business for seven years. So just speaking on the business perspective of things from him literally just putting up music that he liked to to running a record label. We kind of get to see it um, from start to finish. Yeah. So. Really love the episode with Boss, the boss man. Uh, so without any further ado, let's get into it. Let's do it. Boss, welcome to New York City, man. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I rained out, but great. So very excited to dive into your story. Um, I think... A lot of different topics we want to cover, but if you could just talk about the founding of, of Chill Hop and how everything got off the ground and got going, that'd be great. Yeah, so I started in 2013, early 2013. I was just done with my college. College, I just got my college degree, international business. And uh, I did some applications for like jobs, like random jobs. I was like, I wasn't really feeling it. So I was like, how can I help people? How can I learn? How can I, you know, do something by myself? And I was with a, always listening with a friend to music at night. We would just like chill in our hometown because there was nothing really else to do. So we'd be finding this music on like Bandcamp and SoundCloud, which is like the new job is kind of like beats. Um, but it was very hard to find this music online. That was You really had to dig for it. So I was like, man, more people should know about this music. So then I had the idea to start a blog so I could just share the music Um get to know more about the music, about like building a website, doing communication, like marketing, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, I started a blog. I wrote a few like album reviews, but I figured it doesn't make sense if you're writing album reviews when nobody has even <laughs> heard of the music, right? So then I started a YouTube channel. I've always been like a computer nerd. So I have some decent knowledge about like Photoshop and mm-hmm. Premiere and all that stuff and like video editing. So uh, yeah, I just started talking to the artists, like asking you know the artists that I that I liked if I could upload their music and promo it on the channel. So that's when the YouTube channel started. You know, I did that for like two years, just promoing music, talking to the artists. I spent most of my time just like talking to artists. And then after like two or three years, I was like, I always had the idea to start a label, but always had the feeling like oh that be like running a label is like something super. Um, advanced and like complicated and stuff and I found out you know I already had a pretty good foundation to start a label and the reason I wanted to start a label is so that I could get more involved in the creative process and help Mm -hmm. artists uh, more so than just like uploading their music Um, so yeah I had the idea to to do like a compilation to start it out and I was like talking to the artists and it all went really well because I've been spending like three years talking to these artists every day 
So they, I've already built like a relationship with them. So it was a very natural progression. And I've already, I already had the YouTube channel back then. And it's like, it wasn't that big, but still like at the time it was like significant. So, so yeah, I just started the label, started putting stuff out on, on Spotify and digital first. And then it, then it grew. We got some people on board. Um, yeah, we got like two people, like our A&R manager that's from Germany and our uh, head of design that's from France. And so we decided to all move to Rotterdam to really build out the company. Mm -hmm. So then we all moved to Rotterdam and like it started scaling and then it started like exponentially growing. So right, right, right. And now we're here. <laughs> Awesome. You made, made yeah. it to the podcast. Yeah, yeah, made it. <laughs> Started from Rotterdam, mm -hmm. now we're here. Yeah. That's awesome. Can you talk, I mean, in the early stage when it came to just building up the YouTube channel, what are some of the big lessons you learned when it comes to building up a kind of community and following online and even more platform-specific tactics to YouTube? I think YouTube back then was sort of different and mm -hmm. you were more so pushing the music as a whole as opposed to like, pushing your channel in between a lot of channels that are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it was largely unexplored territory in, ter in, types of, in terms of the music that we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, so that had like a different approach than now. So then I was like, okay, because now it's like the music that we're doing, everyone's like calling it like beats to relax, study to. Uh, <laughs> right. And now everyone knows that, you know, that's what works with people. But back then that was, you know, I was still figuring out what the angle was. So I was like, okay, so one of the first mixes we did was like called Chill Study Beats. And that was, I actually sort of like came up with that because it didn't exist yet. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh shit, this really works. So I was like, okay, then it works. And then we built that out. So you really had to like find out the format that worked. And, you know, we did a lot of different, uh, different formats in terms of like visuals and stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So First, we started with like the photos, then it got to a little bit more digital art, then I got an animation in there. And it's mm -hmm. like for the music that we were doing, I found that the visuals were very important as well. So, yeah. uh, so that was a lot of like finding what worked on that on that end. And then I started the, the, the live stream. Uh, so we had one of the first live streams on YouTube in general, and that was in like 2015, I think. So that was that was nice to start and that gave it a boost from the start. Um, so I think that was like a big thing. So like in terms of YouTube, that was it was just a lot of like unexplored territory. So I was just trying a lot of different stuff because I feel like if you're small, you still have the space to do whatever you want, right? You're still flexible. Like people are not expecting like a specific format. So you still have the space to 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 try different things and you know double down on whatever is working and like explore that further. Right. I think that goes across a lot of different things in music. Um, I think a lot of people at least that I know, in, in terms of just being a musician, they also wait almost too long to release their stuff because they don't realize that you can be flexible in the beginning and you can take risks. You know what I mean? I, I think so as well. And, and what I think as well is that when you run a platform, you tend to get very focused on like, yeah, we need to be consistent and like have the same formats. But people often tend to forget that nobody cares as much about the platform as you do. So like mm -hmm. the people listening are like, yeah, they they see it come by like every once in a while, but they're not like working on it like every day. <laughs> so I feel like people make it sort of hard on themselves as well by being like, okay, we just got to stick to this format. And like, sure, consistency is important, but I also feel like being able to ex keep experimenting um, is just going to give you an advantage. And that's why like smaller companies are like more flexible and like, you know, right. it's easier for smaller companies to do stuff because like they, they are flexible and like what they can do in terms of format. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so you guys are do uh, with the playlists, you're doing something that um, me and my office were trying to figure out how to successfully monetize, which is passive listening. Yeah. So like people listen to some of the playlists that you have mm -hmm. to relax, to chill, to study, including myself. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have a label of artists. Yeah. So how do you think... Um, or how do you currently turn those passive listeners into people that will show up at the shows or people that will buy merchandise? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that's like one of the major challenges that we're facing in this music because people, like sure, people will put on a playlist and, you know, the, the amount of streams is, is kind of high on these playlists. Right. But a lot of people listen like in the background. So they're not as engaged with with the music and the artist as as you would want or, or as you would see in other uh, genres of music. 
So that's what we're doubling down on um, this year as well. It's just like building more the story and show, showcasing more of the artists, like doing, um, yeah, we're, we're starting the podcast. We're, we're starting like a cafe. Um, we're building more around the releases as opposed to just like, you know, having a release, throwing it on Spotify, that kind of stuff. So we're really trying to share more um, about the brand, about the artists. Mm. Um, Sometimes it takes a little work to get, you know, to to get the artist to really also even know, you know, what's the story, like what got them to release the music, because it's like easy for artists to just release like a beat tape and be like, okay, these are the beats, they are nice to listen mm-hmm. to. But for us, you know, in terms of building longevity, we really want to, you know, dig in the in the in the creative process on like what what is the story of the artist as well. Mm-hmm. But that's that's like the that's the challenge, I think. And um yeah, that's something that we're exploring uh, this year as well. I mean, there are pluses and minuses to each, right? So, like active listeners, they tend to be smaller than 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 passive listeners. Obviously, that's how that's kind of how playlists work on on Spotify, yeah. iTunes, that sort of thing. It's a lot of these streams that people are getting um, every week on New Music Friday, for example. Yeah. Most of them are listeners that just listen to the whole playlist yeah. front to back. Um, but I do think you and you guys are on the forefront of this that. And this is what I was talking about in my office, that there is a way, like once you guys figure out how to turn that passive, those listeners into active listeners and you have both, then that's it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you, you're, you're having trouble turning them into active listeners. We're having trouble getting passive listeners. We, yeah. we want passive listeners. You yeah. know, we're trying to figure out, you know, how they'll listen to our artists when they're on airplanes, uh, in the library, that yeah. sort of thing also, you know, so what what i think is important also in the music itself is that you got to accept the fact that you know the numbers that you're getting on spotify is not the quantity of like listeners that you'll be able to convert to to active listeners mm-hmm. and i feel like it's a sort of it's a dangerous thing as well because you know if people have these numbers on spotify and they'll they'll try a different format that goes a little bit deeper into like the music and the artists and stuff and the numbers won't match up to what they expect uh, because they base it on the Spotify listeners. Um, they'll be like discouraged to, to try something else. Right. And, and I feel like that's kind of like dangerous because then people will just like double down on, on like the Spotify stream numbers because like that's like, oh, I'm getting like millions of streams there. But, you know, when I try a different format, I'm only getting like a few hundred listeners and right. they'll, they'll then like not try a different format anymore and double down on Spotify. And I think like it's it's important to to also work on like actually building your brand and making people link with it but because that's, you know, that's going to like diminish sort of the vol- vol- volatility of the yeah. of the of yeah. the listeners that you have on on Spotify cuz cuz I think the thing is like if people listen to a playlist and you get thrown off the playlist like you lose your listeners. Yeah. But if people are bought into your brand, it's like easier to to For sure. keep people. Totally. Right. So, I mean, I think it's cool how it's really evolved into its own label. I mean, what do you personally feel are like some of the, I mean, the role of a label has evolved a lot. And I personally feel that owning distribution and having direct access to an audience is going to be a a much more consistent thread uh, along future labels. And I think Mm -hmm. you're doing it with yours. I think that's where a lot of the the power is and having a connection with the audience. Obviously, it's nice to have be able to have a account rep at Spotify who can help on playlisting there, but you having your own community is incredibly valuable. What do you personally think are is uh, are the most valuable elements that record labels can and should be providing today? I think it depends on like what your artists are doing. I think first and foremost, it's just like depends on like how can you offer value to the artist, right? And it might be different in different different genres or different types of artists. It just depends on what the artists are looking for. So I think that should be the focus for us. You know, when the music was not really um, popular, it was just like providing an audience. Mm-hmm. Um but now that the space is getting more competitive, it's also, in my opinion, it's also like taking care of the artists so the artists feel at home. Um, but for us, you know, we started with, you know, with a lot of labels, they start a label and then they're like, okay, we got to build an audience. But we already had an audience from the YouTube channel mm. and then we built a label around it. So mm. we, we actually naturally fell into you know, <laughs> right. how labels are starting to operate. Um but yeah, I think it's just it's just like listening to the artists. And and I feel like that's what helped the kickstart the label as well, because I was talking to the artists so much that I really knew, you know, what I could do to help them. 
So like at first it was like the Spotify playlist, but also, well, I think back then it was even hard for the artists to get, even get their music on Spotify. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, one of the first things then building up the playlist and then also helping just like doing the visuals and stuff. So I feel it's just a matter of like listening to the artist. It's kind of hard to give like a fixed answer because, you know, the artist that, that one label works with is, uh, needs to double down on other stuff than, than, than another label. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like it just depends on it just depends on the artists that you work with and the the space that you're in, and it also you know it also depends on like is this do you want to do something to to differentiate yourself from other labels? Do you want to do something just to to help the artists in general? I feel like there's a lot of aspects that come into play that that sort of lead to decisions on where to focus on mm -hmm. as a as a label, and then of course you need to have on all aspects you need to have a certain level of of service, right? Mm -hmm, so right. even like paying out the artists, so we pay out artists every every month, um, just because I feel like you know the artists are a lot of artists are living like month to month, so yeah. it's a it's something that doesn't perhaps doesn't really provide something for us directly, but I feel like it's something that we can really do to to help the artists, and and that's a. You're that's also a big building incentive. trust too. Yeah, exactly. You know? That's a, so. that's an incentive in itself, but right. It's a it's a lot of work to do to do I'm like sure. monthly accounting. I'm but, sure. Yeah. I know for a lot of labels, it's like six months. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like it takes a long time. You put the album, you don't see the royalties from it for six months. Yeah. So yeah. you got to figure out some money outside of it. <laughs> yeah, um, Sam, do you think distribution is like the the main thing in your opinion that that labels should should focus on? I, per, I mean, I think if you really distill the value of labels down, I think it's primarily funding and distribution oftentimes i think certain labels or imprints do provide a level of like a and r and not just a and r as far as like recruiting artists to their label but more so facilitating beautiful collaborations between other artists producers so they can really kind of aid a hand in the actual like production of the finished product um so i, I think those are the three biggest things but yeah i think i think Hot take. I think music is largely <laughs> commoditized. I think distribution is the most valuable asset you can have. I think there's a lot of really shitty music that gets tons of distribution. So I think if you have access to reach a community or are working with a, um, I mean, look at like Lyrical Lemonade. He makes dope videos. And I, I'm not like shitting on any of the music that goes live on that channel, but it's like any, I mean, SoundCloud, and I'm also not a fan of the term SoundCloud rapper, but like he is literally like the aspiration of any SoundCloud rapper because they know if like Cole makes their video and it goes live on Lyrical Lemonade, the likelihood that they're about to blow up as an artist is that much higher. And that's just because of the fact that they have that built-in distribution. Or do you think it's because of the fact that Cole has a good eye to for like it's kind of a perfect storm of things, you know? Like yeah. I, don't, I don't think I, – I don't think – Lyrical Lemonade has ever pushed, at least in my experience, an yeah. artist that was like really ass. You right. know what I mean? Like, no, I, I agree with that. <laughs> I think if you were to consistently push ass, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It would work like, well. it would, like, no, you know what I mean? Saying, uh, like, so yeah, He's I mean, I think there, the product too, there's a know? level of like taste and curation always. So, I mean, that's the, the whole notion that like music gets commoditized is a dr a dramatization, or, but I think to an extent, it's like if you had to pick between like, and I think we will fundamentally disagree at this, given that I'm a marketer and you work with like <laughs> music, uh, like with like closer, I guess, on management directly with artists. It's like for me, it's like uh, I've seen way more artists create great stuff that's never seen the light of day or been heard by people than I have on the flip side where you see artists that are making like OK music, but are still able to like break through because they're very clever when it comes to marketing and building an audience. What do you think, boss? Yeah, I agree. Um, when you look at like what's important, like A, for sure, like the distribution is important. You got to be able to reach people. Mm -hmm. But I think people often forget, you know, the value of like just creating something that artists can link with. So, for example, for us, we now have like our office in Rotterdam. We have artists coming by every week and just them being able to see people in real life and like mm. connecting with different artists, being in our even if it's a tiny studio, this being able to be there with other artists and make music and have something to link with is very beneficial to the artists as well. And I feel like that's often forgotten in a sort of like digital world because it's like focused on like the numbers and, you know, that's, that's where people base their value on. But I feel like it's very important for people to, to be able to, to be somewhere in real life and not just be behind a computer screen and like looking at, you know, how am I going to get the, the numbers up? And like, I've seen, 
within what we're doing is that us linking with the artists and the artists being around is like a huge boost to creative, but also being able to find angles to like, mm-hmm. you know, maximize on distribution in a way. So I feel like it's a matter of like finding the balance between the both, because I feel like if you do either one or the other, it's like, yeah, for it, sure. does, it doesn't work. It's like a constant. And that's what we're doing as a label, you know, constantly reevaluating all of the aspects that we're doing because we have 25 people working in a company. So like wow. everyone's doing something and you're constantly like reevaluating to see like what are the weak points? What what should we do to to provide more value and what's the value most valuable thing we can focus mm-hmm. on at this point? Totally. And you can I'm sure you can learn from different artists in that respect too. So like with one artist this may not be working, but with another one, it may. Or with one artist, this is this artist's weak point. This is another artist's strong point. How do we connect the dots there and, and figure out what we learn from this strong artist and bring it to this artist's other artist's weak area? Yeah, I think sort of an inher- inherent sort of aspect of the music that we're doing is that it's it's very... People are spending time online most of the time. You know, mm. it's not... At the moment, there's not like... When you look at the numbers of the music there is not much of a real life scene around it. Like sure, there's smaller scenes and there's smaller events, but it doesn't like weigh up to the to the amount of traffic that the music is getting online. Right. So what I think is very important is to actually establish a sort of like culture around it that, you know, brings people together. And I feel like that's, that's a, like a big value that we can offer now. And even us, like you say, like even us being with the artist, like inspires us to be like, oh shit, we can help the artist in that way. Because you can only do so much when you're chatting with the artist online, but when you're just like having a beer with the artist and just going out for dinner, or, like sitting There's a in the studio. Con- personal connection for sure. Exactly. I think that's like super important. And, you know, in the digital world of now, like, Today, it's like very easy to forget that because it's so easy to con- connect online. And it's a lot of effort to, to fly, especially for the artists that are from the States, for example, to fly over to, to the Netherlands. But I've always seen like a huge, uh, huge value if artists do so. Yeah, for sure. What, um, when you think about your approach, I mean, it's still early 2020. When you think about your approach to serving artists like this year, uh, how has it evolved from last year? You mentioned constantly refining and allo- making sure your team's efforts are going towards the right direction. Yeah. What, what's evolved in your approach in the, the recent years? Um, yeah. So we're trying to bring the artists more to the forefront because I feel like it's very easy to just be hundred percent brand focus because of the, the lot of the people online like link with the brand because of, but I feel it creates a sort of situation which is not balanced because as a label you'll have all of the control because you'll be able to because people link with the brand mm-hmm. and while I feel like maybe it's for, for a brand it's like maybe people would like that control but I honestly don't really like it I would like to have um, a situation where the artist, has a brand of themselves as well. So we're really trying to um, motivate the artists to think about, you know, what is their brand? Because A, it's like, it's good for us as well if they have a brand, because then we can combine it and be like, you know, we can combine our brand with what they're doing and and sort of build in that way. Um, so like we're, we're doing t- stuff like more live stuff, um, setting up the podcast to just like have the artists show a little bit more about themselves so so that the people that are listening can link with the artists and, and sort of like motivate the artists to sort of explore what they're all about. Mm-hmm. And then furthermore, you know, as as we're growing, we're all also trying to um, educate the artists more. So we'll have like a monthly newsletter where we're just like talking about stuff that's, that's important because a lot of these uh, artists... Um, they're like bedroom producers and we'll be telling them about, you know, registering themselves for like publishing to collect like publishing royalties. And that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. that's even like explaining that to somebody is still like, a lot of the artists don't understand what it is. So, right. so we're trying to also just help the artists so so they can be independent in a way, but also it makes it easier in the future because they're already aware of like they'll have like a good basic um, uh, level of knowledge. So what? How do you guys find artists? What's like your, you know, some people come on here and they say word of mouth. Some people say, you know, we look at the data and then we go back to um, the music after the data. Some people it's the other way around where we hear the music and then we look at the data. Some people we listen to the music and don't care about the data. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah, for us, we have our A&R manager, Simon. He's the, he's the biggest music nerd. He has a very, mm-hmm. very good ear for music and he just spends all day like talking to artists, listening to music. We don't really work with submissions because it's just too overwhelming. It, like, yeah. it doesn't it's not practical for us to do so. Like we've talked to some companies that do like AI for sort of pre-filtering of music and submissions, but at this point it's really not worth it. And, you know, we have a great network of artists and and we'll be recommended like artists by artists that we're already working on. And in that way, it's, um, it's been pretty easy to find like good music. And, and I, you know, there's a lot of this music being made, but I still feel like the quality of music that we're putting out is like is like great. And if the, and if that wouldn't be great, I would be worried. But Simon <laughs> is always like spot on in terms of like finding the music. Sometimes he's a little bit stressed because we have like these seasonal compilations with like 24, 25 tracks, and uh, so it's like 25 exclusive tracks by different artists. So it's yeah. a it's a lot of like gathering music, but you know he he keeps a good eye on like a, a good ear, I would say, on, on you know what's happening in the music. And yeah, we've built up a good um, core group of artists, but also always include like new artists. So every compilation, I'll be like hearing a new artist and be like, oh, we're still like innovating sort of in in the in the sound. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You guys are, like, trying to find artists to sign, but you're also trying to find artists in general for, like, your playlists. So you're, like, the A&R process is a lot more wide open, and you guys have to keep your ears open a lot longer than, say, like, somebody who is at a label. They sign an artist. You know, that's it. They've signed the artist. You know what I mean? That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except you're, like, you you sign an artist, you put the artist in the playlist, but you're also trying to curate playlists. It's almost like if Spotify were to have a label or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And sort of, so we don't sign artists exclusively. So we, we sign on like a track by track basis. Oh, so, so we still allow, because we want artists to be wanting to, you know, release with us. Because I feel like that's the best. If, right. if they don't want to release with us, then that's something that we should fix within the label <laughs> as opposed to like being like, oh yeah, it's in the contract. You got to yeah. do it. And I, think for, and I think for the model that we're doing, it doesn't sort of like, it's hard for us to justify like having exclusive contracts with artists. Right. And if if an artist is better off somewhere else, you know, I don't want to keep, I don't want to hold an artist back. So in terms of curation, it, it changes it over time, right? Because now there's so much of this music being made that we're getting more and more selective because like you have so much of these playlists and you'll have, you'll have like splice where, where every artist can just go and like get samples and like, it's getting easier and easier to make like a basic, like lo-fi hip-hop or chill hop tracks so so we're getting like more and more selective in terms of like okay what makes an artist stand out you know and what's what are the goals for the brand so like we'll have a few artists now that um their music won't really fit within like the playlist that we're doing right but just because we're um, doubling down on other uh, formats we can still serve the artists in, in different ways whereas before it would be hard because a lot of our value would be based on the playlist so if if an artist would come with music and we we would like it, but it wouldn't fit in a playlist, it would be hard for us to offer the value that we would want. Right. So for example, there's an artist that is now working on a live band and like surely like that music won't be like the most popular music on the playlist, but just because we're getting a you know nice spaces where we can film stuff and we're getting more resources in terms of like doing media, um, it allows us to serve that music without having to fit in the playlist right right so i feel like that also sort of influences how we do curation and a and r right um you guys also try pretty hard to build a community Mm -hmm. right so what are some ways that you guys build that up and and you know give it two feet and legs so it can have longevity um yeah first first and foremost of course like using the platforms that are there you know discord live stream uh, what type of stuff you guys do in discord yeah, we just have like a server and uh, we have a we have a good um, team of like uh, moderators and stuff. And they'll oh, always awesome. they'll always do like stuff and I'll, I'll tune in and there will be people listening to music together there or, the, or wow. they'll have like, I don't know, they'll have like small fun, fun events. And we're doing a lot of stuff to build um, community. We've done some AMAs in the past on, on, on Reddit and that kind of stuff. We, we have our subreddit as well. Um a fun example of what we've done is like, so around Christmas, we did uh, an event called Pen Pause, where we had illustrators um, that we work with mm-hmm. make like 10 illustrations to put on postcards. 
and people could sign up, like people from the community community could sign up and we would send them um, five postcards, empty postcards, like the ones that we made exclusively. We would send them five postcards for free and uh, the addresses of five other people that signed up. And they were just like sending postcards to each other all over the world. Damn, that's sick. So it's nice because like that allows like a connection between the people as well. And it's like, it's nice for us as a brand. And it's also nice for for the people to be able to connect uh, to each other. So like, I feel like these kinds of, when when you find these formats that work for you and also for the people, that's like, for me, that's like one of the biggest things that we want to focus more on. That's amazing. Beyond some of that stuff, I mean, what are other ways? I mean, you host different events to nurture and really create that community connection too, yeah? Yeah, we're doing events. We're planning to do events more. So we had an event yesterday here in New York and it was great because because it's a good indication. Like there's so many artists that just come out because they're so hyped to, you know, showcase themselves more. And like there's there's a lot of fans coming out even though you know, it's it's something that is still in the starting starting block. So I feel like there's a lot of potential there. Um, we're doing a lot on the on the tech side as well. So you know, we have our own website. We're catering to people that, you know, we have the newsletter, of course, and then we're catering to creators on YouTube as well. So we're trying to you know um, build a connection with them as well to be to allow them to use our music, um, that kind of stuff. And and I feel in terms of like events where I think we want to do that more as well. So we have a. Uh, we have like a, the we have a apartment next to our office that's going to be the scene for both the podcasts and we'll also be able to invite artists out and do like live streams on Twitch and connect nice. with people mm-hmm. that way in a more like interactive casual way so that's yeah. awesome yeah that's um that's one thing that I think I've been trying to prioritize more in 2020 obviously you have playlists and things outside of your label but you know asking yourself if you're an artist do you have a community And two, how do you connect that community um, together? You know, I think that's, I think that's uh, moving forward, in my opinion, that's how people will weed out the people on Spotify that have 1.5 million listeners, but don't go, but nobody goes to a show from the people that do. It's how do you, how do you take those listeners and other, and, and figure out what else they have in common, you know? What I think is important is to sort of identify the platforms as well. So when you look at Spotify, it's a great platform for like, streams and you know revenue but it doesn't have any social features so it's sort of like an end station right you can't really do anything with the listeners that are on spotify whereas like on youtube you know youtube you have like way more freedom to you know uh, engage with the with with the community so you gotta like see the platforms and kind of like know what platforms are are good for and, and sort of like place them in inside your strategy as like where they're most fitting I feel like that's very important because every every platform has its like unique unique aspects and it's like yeah that's where people should start you know like what do you want to do and like what platform is fitting for that like now mm. but now with TikTok for example everyone's like yeah you got to get in on TikTok and blah 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 but you need to have like a good idea of like what you actually <laughs> want to do with it it's not like right. you're just going to throw your stuff on there and it's going to work you know you you need to have content that's fitting for the platform and and you know for the purpose that you want to achieve mm-hmm. like if you want to make revenue sure focus on spotify but if you want to connect with listeners like you got to use these platforms like youtube and maybe like tiktok you can do like something very personal casual mm-hmm. and i feel like that's why these platforms are getting popular as well because people want to feel as close as possible to the artist so i feel like you know with, with these platforms it's possible to do so and, and with right. spotify it's just a different purpose so i feel like that's very important to sort of identify what each platform is for and use them uh, uh, right. appropriately. And that's something that we come back to on the podcast a lot is, is I think managers, artists, labels a lot of the time don't ask themselves, what's the strategy? Like, why are we making the decision that we are making to do this? You know, obviously sometimes it's not relevant. So like if you're booking a, a flight for your artist and you're choosing between aisle and window, yeah. it's, it's yeah. not like, it's not like, oh man, we got to choose yeah. aisle because people just think of him as, you know, closer to the, Closer to the middle, you know, yeah. <laughs> like that doesn't yeah. make sense. But when you're when you're choosing, you know, whether you want to go on TikTok, YouTube, those things, like you're saying, yeah, obviously you'll probably need to figure out something on TikTok. It's kind of like with 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 the boom of MySpace, Facebook, and that sort of thing. But I would also advocate, and you know, maybe you can agree with this or disagree with this. You let me know. Um, like you're saying, before you get on, know what you're doing it for. 
You yeah, know? exactly. So. I think that's very important. You got to like, because for one artist, they would want to have, you know, a big following, a lot of streams. They want to make big income from the music so they can do what they want to do. For other artists, they might want to cater to a niche audience and just like connect on a very deep level. And I feel like before you even construct a strategy, you got to <laughs> pinpoint what what it is you actually want to do. Yeah. Because otherwise you're just like, and I feel like it's very easy nowadays to be because people value themselves with like the streaming numbers and that kind of stuff. So it's very easy to be tunnel visioning on that because people value themselves by the streaming numbers they get. But for a lot of people, it shouldn't really be this way. A lot of people like are more relaxed and, and they'll enjoy life more if they just cater to like a smaller audience and like really connect with them on a deeper level. But just because like nowadays you'll have like Spotify playlists that everyone's like focusing on, like you'll get like, pushed in this direction as well to be like, okay, I got to get more monthly listeners than I had before. Because like that, that's the easiest thing to tap into. Mm -hmm. Because like if, if you want to make a funnel and create a community, you have to be like more creative in terms of like, okay, I got to talk to these people on Instagram. I got to get them to, to my website. I got to have an email newsletter. And it's like, it's, it's not as straightforward as being mm -hmm. like, okay, I got to put out music and I got to pitch it to a playlist or <laughs> pitch it to a label and, and get on the playlist. So I feel like it's very important for artists um, nowadays to, to kind of really dig, dig deep in like what they actually want to, want to achieve with what they're doing. Yeah. How do you make those fans stick? Yeah. And any, you know? any decision and any goal is like, there's not a right or wrong goal. It just depends on the, on the person. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And I guess as a manager, you know, that's your goal is just like help the artists, you know? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of it is also not just learning from experience, but learning from the label sometimes, yeah, <laughs> you know, learning yeah. from the publicist sometimes, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, uh, it's niche in the, in the way that we work with artists, the artist on everything. Mm -hmm. But because of that, you have to be careful that you're not a generalist, that you're, that you're a jack of all trades and not a master of none, you know? Yeah, so. it depends on the resources that you have. Even exactly. for us, like, uh, yeah, sure, we're a label, but we're helping artists on all sides as well. We're, we're yeah. also doing, like, pseudo management in a way where, where we're just, like, edu educating the artists. Because at a certain point, there's, like, there's so much labels because they see, like, oh, yeah, we can just sign the artist, you know, pitch them to a playlist and we'll get, like, you know, 30 or 50 percent of their revenue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I feel like you, you should really, like, a lot of artists, especially in our space, they really need management because they'll be signing exclusive deals for five years with a company that doesn't really do anything for them. I was like, there should be more managers, but just because there's a lot of people that are like, you know, they're focusing on like, what can I get out of it? As opposed to like, what do the artists really need? And I feel like if you do that, you're like pushing too much, but as opposed to that, if you were, if you know what the artists need and you can provide it, like everything starts to roll by itself. Right, right, right. That's awesome. Awesome. When it comes to like artist community management, I really like the point you're making around nurturing that connection with your audience, even if, I mean, and focusing on creating that deeper connection rather than instantly defaulting to like scale. Mm -hmm. What are specific tactics or things you've seen work well beyond what you meant? I mean, for artists and, and how artists can truly engage their community at a greater level. I think that's a, that's a good question. That's <laughs> definitely something that we're still figuring out yeah. um, in, in our genre because the people don't really know the artist. And, and just because the artist defaulted to relying on the label for, um, for um, engagement and for exposure, they haven't really built much of themselves. Right. So I feel like for us and for the artists in, in, uh, in our genre, it's, it's mostly just like starting to be able to identify who they are and sort of like what they want to right. what they want to bring across and as and if that's clear then you can build from something but if you don't have a direction like what are you going to base your instagram on like mm -hmm. if you're just going to are you just going to post pictures of yourself yeah yeah, yeah, yeah for sure <laughs> especially if you have like instrumental music right if you have like vocalists and stuff it's like way easier to communicate a message because you're talking already with instrumental music it's like harder because it like leaves a lot of stuff open for interpretation which is nice in a way but it like makes it less straightforward in terms of like communicating a message mm -hmm. so we're really working with artists and we're just like talking to them it's like okay trying to get to know them and trying to sort of like help them 
um, formulate what they want to do as well. So whereas before, you know, some artists would come to us and we'll, they'd come with a beat tape and we put a cover on it and we'd release it to, to Spotify. Now we're turning down on the, on the number of releases and we're actually sitting down with the artists and being like, okay, um, what do you want to communicate with, with this album? And if, and if the artist doesn't really have much of an idea, it's like, okay, does it really fit with the direction that we're going in as a brand? Because if we want to create a deeper connection with, um, between the artists and, and the listeners and between um, the listeners and, and us, we have to, it makes most sense to work with artists that also, you know, prioritize this because otherwise you'll just be, if an artist comes to us and they'll, they just want to be on like Spotify playlist. It doesn't really make sense for us because there's no value for us to right. to build further. And I feel like at this point in, in terms of like being able to differentiate yourself, it's that's that's the thing that that we're focusing on. Totally. Yeah, I think in that situation you probably more I mean, even distribution companies don't think that small. <laughs> like just to get on just to get on Spotify playlists, even distribution companies are trying to build something, you know. Yeah, exactly. um, but I do think if if an artist if that's a little bit more than what they want to do, then they could. There are companies that literally just try to do that, just pitch. Mm-hmm. But that's like not the fun part, yeah. <laughs> you know, for, from somebody working. Yeah, but know? it's a, it's a matter of like getting to know the people as well, because mm-hmm. like you as a manager and like you 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 know the artists, right? And like as a label, you're talking to so many different artists that it's really like hard to to get to really get to know the artists, especially in, in in the format of what we're doing, like the labels are working with a lot of different artists because the beats are, you know, it's it's something that that can be like high quantity. So it's like easy for them to get beats in by different mm-hmm. people. So it's a little bit harder to really find what makes the artist tick. So that's why it's it's sort of easy to default to, okay, we'll, you know, we'll provide revenue. We'll put, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But but that's but that's really that's really the point. And that's really what we're trying to to solve and like I, I totally understand if people you know artists need to make a living as well to be able to to do music full time so it's a very important thing as well but it's just not our main focus um, anymore mm-hmm. also for me personally you know if I'm spending you know most of my time in a day working on something I want to you know be able to to know you know what are we doing it for to be able to connect with the artists as well i want to personally align with the artists that we're working with as well because it makes it way easier to work on something because if you don't vibe with an artist like it like what are you do as a label like what are you doing you need to you need to be able to to align with artists to make it easier to to build something up right absolutely absolutely um, what do you think is different from a, a type of label that you run in a traditional label and the positives and negatives between the two? Um, I think the positive is that we're sort of a hybrid label. So we mm. will have the flexibility to do a lot of stuff. Also on the technical side, we're doing we're doing quite some stuff that will really benefit the artists. Right. Um, even in terms of like building up releases, we've built our whole whole uh, intranet where we're building up the releases, where we communicate with the artists. So everything is going like very smooth there mm-hmm. to be able to keep up with sort of, you know, especially in the compilations where you have like 25 artists, things get tend to get scattered. So we're, we're trying to build up, you know, they can log in there, they can see articles that will help them educate themselves on stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. They'll get their statistics in, in terms of like... Uh, you know what, like analytics, they'll get accounting stuff in there, um, that kind of stuff. And I feel like us being, you know, hybrid in a way where we can just focus on what we want to focus on. That's like a positive. Yeah. Um, I, I guess a negative is just the fact that the music that we're focusing on is is has, but that's I'm not sure if that's label related or just like music related. It's like mm-hmm. the music has grown so fast in a short amount of time is that, you know, we're trying to build longevity and sort of differentiate ourselves from the trends to make sure that, you know, if something happens with with the trend and like people listening, that we'll still be like fine and doing our own thing. And I feel like that's something that we're definitely focusing on. Um, a negative as well is, you know, the sort of reliance on streaming. Mm-hmm. Um you know, maybe for different artists and artists that you guys work with, they'll do like live shows and that'll be a significant income stream as well. Um, for us in the past, it's like 
it's been a lot of like revenue from Spotify because people just like listen there on the playlist um, passively. But we're really trying to diversify there as well, which is why we have the team and why we're investing a lot from the label side um, in terms of, you know, doing, uh, creating different revenue streams and, you know, diversifying our business model, so to say. Right, right. You guys don't re-release the songs when you put them on Spotify playlists, right? What do you mean, re-release? So like Colors, yeah. they have people come on, they perform, and then they release a Colors version on oh, Spotify. Yeah. Um, and then they split the revenue on that too. So it's sort of like what you're doing for YouTube, except they they figured out how to also do it on Spotify. But it's a little different, you know? Yeah. We're, well, especially if, we, if we're if we um, going to do more live stuff, then we're yeah. going to re-release tracks as well. Um, apart from that, not that much, honestly, right. at the moment. So we have a sub-label as well, which is more focused on like cinematographic, like mm. ambient stuff. Mm-hmm. And so opportunities there would be, you know, to take a track from there and create like a chill-up version. Yeah, so I guess yeah, yeah. it's not really a re-release, but it creates some opportunities mm-hmm. there as well. Right. That's cool. That's cool. Awesome, man. Well, I guess last uh, question that I have is ultimately, um, I mean, you've alluded a lot to brand and the value of brand and doing things to preserve and create an identity around a brand. I, I think about it a lot, too, when it comes to artists and really identifying what are kind of the core brand pillars or things that make this brand unique or an artist's story unique that will resonate with people. When you think of kind of this notion of like constructing and communicating and building a brand, how do you distill like what a brand is and how our listeners can think about it as they construct their own brands? Um, I think it just comes mostly from culture, you know, and that's like internally and externally. So like the the, the cult, culture that we have in the company is just always being genuine, always thinking about the best interests of everyone, always just being chill and no facades, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's important yeah, for us. a lot too. So yeah, I exactly. Can tell <laughs> exactly. And I mean, that's, that's the way we're communicating with... Thought he with, was lying when he made yeah. you up? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not fake, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but really, it's also like, it's just communicating to people like they're real people. We're not trying to play people. We're not, mm-hmm. you know, trying to influence people. We're not trying to get, you know, the best deal. We're always trying to get, you know, something that fits for everyone. Mm-hmm. If something becomes out of balance, we're always open to to like fix it. And that makes it that makes it nice for us in terms of like um, doing community stuff. Because we can be 100% transparent and it's fine, you know, because we don't hold anything back and we stand fully behind what we do. So anything we'll do is like, yeah, it's just, it's just us. And I think that's, that's the most important thing starting out. And, you know, everything just comes from the chill environment. So even, even for us, the way we work in the company itself is like, people can work from home, people can work flexible hours. And, and I feel like because we have that internally, that also flows out to like, Everything. So everyone working in the company and communicates with the community or, you know, somebody doing social media, they'll just like talk from from themselves because they align with the company vision and the company culture as well. Yeah. And I think that's very, very important in terms of like foundation and, and like how how you build a brand. It's sure. like if, if your stuff is on point internally, I feel like it will naturally, you know, flow out as a brand as well. Totally. And I like feel it, like artists feel that too. So like yeah, I'm sure exactly. when artists come in your office in Rotterdam, they're like, wow, everybody here has a great synergy Dude, with They're each just other. chilling. Yeah. Everybody, yeah. Yeah. Everybody Everybody's chilling. Everybody's super chill. <laughs> yeah. they're, just, they're just coming by. They'll, they'll, hang out in the, they'll hang out in the studio. We'll go out to dinner with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's just friends, friends yeah. hanging out. Like even yesterday, I, a lot of the artists that I've, I've seen for the first time, but it's, it's just like, seeing friends that you've already know for, for right. all of your life because yeah. everyone everyone just aligns with each other and like that's cool vibes with each other on that level and that makes it that makes it cool you know we're not we're not like negotiating with artists and and I feel like that's a difference between us as a label and perhaps you know traditional uh, major labels for example as well is that that that's always like a transactional or it can be like a transactional like negotiation and stuff whereas for us it's just like we just have an idea of like what's fair and like we're just creating stuff with friends. Mm-hmm. So like we're we're selecting artists also that we vibe with that makes makes it possible for us to keep that sort of relationship with the artists. Mm-hmm. Right. Awesome. Awesome. Well boss, 
Thank you so much, man. Really enjoyed uh, my pleasure. Going to dive into this, man, and hope your your trip was worthwhile. Yeah, it man. Was. Hope you have a good rest of your trip. Safe flight back uh, home. Hi. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Cheers. My man, boss, man. Ooh. Came in here dropping gems, right? It was incredible, man. I, I really enjoyed his perspective. I think I love seeing digital first record labels, if you will, that have baked in distribution. I think that's the future. I love seeing artists first, uh, music industry executives. You know, mm -hmm. I do think it's a business, but at the end of the day, it's about the music. And it was very clear to him that that was his driver throughout all throughout mm -hmm. all of this. And I think that's inspiring. Yeah, you know? for sure. So. If you haven't already, check out Chill Hop, Spotify, YouTube, wherever music is Go on streams. the website. Go, go through their roster. Yeah. Dig. You Dig. Know? Dig. Dig deep. All right, guys. Well, uh, if you haven't yet, please leave a review on the show. It really helps us. I go back and read every single one, good or bad. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, we will have, like always, um, footage cut up from, from this episode, next episode. So engage on Instagram, um, social media. Give us a shout out, whatever. We appreciate you guys, man. Thank you.